2 Corinthians. And I'm just going to read from the first verse down through about the map. But before I do that, you know, if I could uh, say, is this yours, Esther? Is this the one you just played? I wouldn't have it as smart.
down to the fountain. If you've been forgiven of the sins that were in your life, you receive mercy and grace. But you receive grace in that God says, I know you deserve this, but instead of this, I know you deserve this. The Apostle Paul, and it's going to be somewhat of a lengthy reading this morning, but he said, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. It. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. It. How he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth me. Now pay strict attention, and this is Paul writing, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me of born in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, the buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, Man, I love these words. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. The entire embodiment of what we feel the message would be today is just that very simple message. And in my Bible, they're written in red. And what my Bible tells me in its foreword is that the words of Christ were written in red. So with that being the case, we can imagine Paul having some type of issue. And I have heard over the course of my ministry in one day, I have heard dozens of different versions and each person that would express his opinion, he was convinced and he was dead certain that he knew exactly what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I'm going to confess to you, and this may come as a shock to you that I don't know everything. But I'm going to confess to you I don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. But I do know this. From the blessed words of the Master on high, whatever that thorn in the flesh was, whatever that issue was, God's grace is sufficient. Amen. I happened to uh, uh, listen just a few minutes ago as we were getting ready to come up for prayer and Brother Jeff began the blessed old word, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amen. Amen. That saved a rich like me. Amen. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was yeah. blind, but now I see. Friend, I was in a state, and you were too. Unfit to be loved. Certainly unworthy to be saved. Yet God's grace, well, in spite good. of all that I had done, God's grace yes. was sufficient. To save my soul. Amen. A preacher one time was talking and he was telling about what infirmity Paul had. And according to him, it was the fact that Paul had poor vision, bad eyesight. I didn't call any commotion. If that's what that man wants to believe, that's fine. I believe that Paul had some issue going on that he couldn't deal with in this flesh. And instead of wanting...
going to have to overcome it or whatever. He was praying, God, just take it away. Remember that old song that says, Lord, don't move this mountain. That's the way I feel. I'm not asking you, God, to take the mountain out of my life. Just give me the strength. Amen. Through your amazing grace, Amen. give me the strength to climb it. I am certain of this much. God didn't leave anything out of this book that you and I were intended to know. And I'm going to say this. I'm just, just go with the assumption for a minute that Paul did have poor vision. And that was his thorn in the flesh. Then everybody on God's green earth that was afflicted with poor eyesight could identify with Paul. Yeah, I know how he felt. I know exactly how he felt. I've got that thorn in my flesh too. Can't see worth a dime. Can't see a lick. And that's me, especially if I'm trying to drive at night. So if you see me coming at you, you better find your plate. Quit nodding your head at me. That would be fine for everyone out there that had poor vision. I can identify with Paul. But then someone that was afflicted with poor hearing might say, well, yeah, but it's easy for this one to go by or to go along and do that because their affliction is not as bad as mine is. You see what happens in human nature? We always seem to think that air, if I've got an ailment, if I've got a sickness, if I've got anything going on in my life, it's human nature that I always feel like I'm in a little bit worse shape than everybody else in the world. Poor me. So that's why God let this thing obscure. That way you couldn't see. Well, you know, yeah, it, it's, but it's no wonder that this one can do that because they're not afflicted with bad eyesight or they're not afflicted with uh, bad hearing or they're not afflicted with bad memories. If they had the affliction that I've got, then it would be a whole different ballgame and they would be in a whole different situation. Beloved, hear me when I tell you this. doesn't matter what the affliction is. Doesn't matter what the circumstances of your life is. If you turn it over to God, God's grace is still sufficient. Regardless of all else, God's grace is sufficient. And we could go back. I, I, when I was, uh, to be honest with you, I was not really pondering this particular message a whole lot this morning. But this is what God kind of spoke to me as I walked in the door. And He said, if you're invited to the stand... This is what I want you to tell the people. Because some people may actually, they know it. But the writer said one time, I stir up your pure minds by putting you, I'm not saying that your mind is wrong, I just stir up your pure minds by putting you in remembrance of these things. So whatever you take from this message that we're delivering today, take this above all else, regardless of what my situation in life is, regardless of what my circumstance is, regardless of what my affliction in this flesh may be, God's grace, can you say that with me? God's grace is sufficient. Amen. And going back in God's Word, we can see time and time again where all everything seemed like it was lost. One event being what we were singing about a while ago when, when uh, God was delivering His children out of Egyptian bondage and they came up to the Red Sea. As far as they were concerned, that was the end of it. That was all of it. And they were doomed right there on the spot. God's grace showed up. When God said, Moses, that rod you've got in your hand, all I want you to do is just stand still a minute and stretch that rod out over that Red Sea. And when Moses did that, according to God's Word, and I'll stand on this regardless of what any science wants to tell me, I'm going to take God's Word to be the absolute and ultimate truth. When Moses stretched his hand out, God parted the waters. That was grace. Amen. I was reading just a, a few days ago in my studies and I got to the point when uh, Darius had been placed as a ruler over the, uh, over the kingdom and there was ever here a man by the name of Daniel? I'm not talking about Daniel Boone. I'm talking about Daniel in here. Not a, uh, apparently nothing great. Daniel didn't have the colossal size that Goliath did. Apparently, he didn't have the superhuman strength that Samson did. Uh, but Daniel was just 
probably just a common ordinary fellow like we are. But yet there was something that about Daniel that appealed to someone because he was lifted up and he was to a point he was exalted. He, was, he didn't exalt himself, but he was exalted by the people. Exalted means to be lifted up. He wasn't lifting himself up, but he was lifted up by the people. And some of the, uh, boy, you kind of got to tiptoe around sometimes. But I want to say it like this. Some of the political activists of the day saw how Daniel was being exalted and how he was being thought highly of. And they got mad. Amen. And they started trying to plot how they were going to deal with this little upstart by the name of Daniel. We can't have this because he's being too highly thought of. And we've got to do something to bring him back down. We've got to do something to cause the king, to cause the ruler to lose uh, favor to Daniel. We've got to cause him to start thinking less of Daniel. How are we going to do that? And I would love it if I knew that the enemies of the Christian law were looking at me. I would love to think that they would make the same kind of statement that these folks made against Daniel. Yeah. Because what they said was, we need to do something to cause him to be less thought of, but we're not going to be able to find anything against him Unless it's something concerning. Unless it's something concerning his God. Like the old saying that I used to hear back years ago, if you were caught and put on trial for being a child of God, for being a Christian, could the prosecution bring enough evidence against you to convict you of that? Pretty good food for thought. Maybe. I would like to say, yeah, they wouldn't have any real problem proving that I was a Christian. But they went to the ruler and they said, here's what we like. You're such a mighty ruler and you're such a glorious, and you're such a magnificent person and just so, you're just so wonderful in every way. We want you to send out a decree and sign it into law that for 30 days, anybody that asks a petition of any God except for you Let's put them in the lion's den. That'll teach them. The king actually did this. Sounded pretty good to him because he was probably somewhat of an egotistical uh, person anyway. Sounds good. This will make me look real big and this will make me look good. So I'll put it in the law that way. Anything that anybody wants, if they ask it of anybody besides me, I'll throw them in the lion's den. Daniel knew the decree had been signed. He knew the law was now in effect. We'll call it an executive order. But he knew it was in effect. Did you ever study and read what Daniel did? He ran into the closet and slammed the door where nobody couldn't see him. No, it's not what he knew. <coughs> Daniel knowing what was going on. Man, this excites me. Instead of going and hiding, he walked right up to the open window, looking out over all the land. He went right up, right out in front of her. Man, I tell you what, <laughs> I pray a whole lot in the closet. I pray a whole lot in the bed. If I'm in the car and Rose is driving, I pray a whole, whole lot in the car. <laughs> but thank God I am not ashamed or I am not afraid so far. I have not seen anyone come up with anything that would frighten me enough to keep me from being willing to call out to the name of my almighty God Amen. in front of everybody and everything. Amen. Daniel walked right up to the window three times a day. <coughs> well, guess what? Somebody called him. King, it kind of sounds familiar with what Nebuchadnezzar did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But anyway, King, remember that law that you signed? Yeah. Well, guess what? Daniel's praying to that God that he serves anyway. 
taking the door of the lion's den. They took him probably sometime close to evening. And they put him in the den of lions. No doubt they knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that as soon as Daniel was put in there, and as soon as his escape route was closed off, not going to be nobody in the, <laughs> Sometimes I have felt like I've been thrown to the proverbial light. But these were real, honest to goodness, big, humongous kitty cats with great old big teeth and great old big claws. And they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt when we put him in there and close off his escape route and just leave him in there, they are going to literally rip him to shreds. The next morning, <laughs> they walked up to near where this was supposed to have taken place. King called out, Daniel, that God that you serve, was he able to help you out in this matter? King wasn't really expecting to hear Daniel say anything. <laughs> then, I like to think about it from back in that cave. Daniel's sitting back there probably, and this is just simply my uh, conjecture of the way things probably went out, probably. Daniel went in there and when bedtime came, he scrouched himself down and laid this head of his right back on the big soft belly of one of those big ferocious lions and slept like a baby all night. The king didn't sleep well at all. Is that God that you serve? Was he able to do anything for you in this matter? And then from somewhere back in there came the words, Oh, king! Live forever. In other words, I don't have anything against you, King. But your little plot really didn't work all that well. Because the grace of God. That word grace. Amen. Grace. Well, I don't know what the Bible said. The Bible said Daniel said that God sent his angel and closed the mouth of these lions. So they didn't do me any harm whatsoever. Still, it was grace that closed the mouth of those lines. We could go on and on and on. There's no doubt in my mind that when a little small shepherd boy stood out on a battlefield to face a giant about a little over nine feet tall, and he had nothing but his shepherd's sling and five little stones. Wouldn't have stood a chance. There is no doubt in my mind that when David walked out there on the battlefield, there was a time that even his own brothers and all those folks in Saul's army, not wanting to see what was going to happen to this little fellow, they walked as close up to where the battle was going to go on as they could. But there came a point. They knew not to cross that imaginary line. When David took that one more step, grace stepped in. When David put the stone in the sling and started taking it, Listen, back when I was a young and I was real, I, I was a dead eye with a slingshot. Got me in a whole lot of trouble a whole lot of times, but I was real good with a slingshot. I never saw the day that I would be willing to face Hulk Hogan and leave it no more than a slingshot. When David stepped out with that little sling, Grace stepped in. Grace let David know exactly when to let that stone go. We could go on and on. Grace at the Red Sea. Grace at the battle between David and Goliath. Grace when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the burning fiery furnace. Grace when Daniel was cast into the lion's den. Grace when I was about 19 years old. And began to see what lay ahead of me. Grace, when I knelt down at that altar up there at Sydney Street and poured my heart out to God. Grace.
grace moved in. Okay, that's right. Where's grace at today? Let me tell you about grace today. I was moved to tears. <laughs> When John was talking about his daughter, just a little bit better. When the surgeons went in, John, I'm a firm believer of this. When the surgeons went in and first touched their machinery to make that incision. Bless God. Grace. Move in. When they opened it up, and said, this is the kind of tumor we were expecting. If I understood you about we were expecting it to be more adhered to the brain and not come out. Grace. Right. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. I could not count the times in my life over just the last few years. See, when God gloriously and mercifully and miraculously saved my soul, that wasn't the last time that grace appeared in my life was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace was fears relieved. Amen. How precious did that grace appear Amen. the hour I first believed. You know what? And here is the good point. God never, never runs out of grace. There is an endless supply. In fact, uh, the Peter Quartet back several years ago did a song that I used to think a whole lot of. It said, I keep coming back to the well of grace. Great is its power and sweet is its taste. Whenever temptations and trials I face, I keep coming back to the well. Grace is never in a short supply of love. No matter how much sin abounds. In fact, the writer put it like this. That where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. You know what that's really saying? God's grace outweighs our sins. God's grace outweighs the sins of the entire world. Jesus took the weight of all the sin of the entire world strapped it to a cross and carried it through the streets of Jerusalem up on the dog off his heel. And when Jesus made the cry from the cross and said it is finished, grace abounded. Amen. In this state that we're living in right now with all these things going on around about us, take heart and take courage and rest securely in this. God's grace still abounds. God's grace is still greater than the sin of the world. Is, is, is just absolutely an unbelief. God's grace. How were you saved? Saved by grace through faith. Certainly nothing, and I, you know, a whole lot, I, I, I like to... Uh, just touch a little bit on this, what Paul said. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Lest people should lift me up above that which I know myself to be. And God knows me to be. A lot of these little things that we endure, they're not little, I guess, in one sense of the word, but when compared to grace, it's all new. All of these things, God's grace is sufficient. Paul didn't want himself to be lifted up and be exalted. A lot of people today are not that way. A lot of people love to lift themselves up, just break their own arms, pat themselves on the back. Remember a story, and we will close out with this. An evangelist had come into an area and preached a revival. And while he was preaching that revival, one of the, what the community, community considered to be one of the worst sinners in their midst got saved. And the 
preacher heard and knew what a vile person this was. And after he took the person's confession and prayed with him at the altar, he said, what was it that I preached that made you decide to give your heart to the Lord? The man said, well, now, you know, preacher, you did, you did a good job with the message. I enjoy hearing. Yes, but I want you to tell me what was it that I said that caused you to turn from your sins. And again, preacher, I really, you know, you, you had a good message. I enjoyed the message. And the minister said, but I want to know specifically what phrase did I use because when I go preach in this other place, I can use that same phrase and maybe able to preach another center person. And the man said, well, I'm just level with you, preacher. I've told you three times you did a good job with the ministry. I enjoyed the work. But you see this old sister back about halfway back through the building? You mean the one that's arthritic and walked in on a cane with her head all bent or all bowed over and her shoulders bent and body twisted that way? Her? Here's what happened. I lived those two, the sister. And I would see her quite often. She lived maybe three quarters of a mile or so a mile away from the church. But when church time came, she didn't have people to drive her up in an air conditioned or heated automobile. But I saw her walk. I saw her walking up the hall. Rain, snow, the heat of the sun, whatever it was. I saw her walking to church. I could look at her and tell that she didn't have clothes that were really sufficient. She would dress as the best that she could, but she still looked ragged and she still looked tattered. But when the church doors were open, she would come in and find her seat. Quite often I know that she didn't have sufficient food. Yet when they would be singing the hymns out of the red back hymn or whatever, she would raise her hands and there would be tears. He did a good job, didn't you? He preached to the message. But the dedication of this lady, that's what caused me to start looking into my life and into my soul. That's what caused me to recognize that there was truly something great about this salvation that she had. That's what caused me to understand amazing grace I'll speak the same. To save the rich. Whatever, I'm going to leave you with this. Whatever is occurring, even this pandemic that we're going through, I thought I was going to get through an entire message without ever once mentioning this. But we need to keep in our hearts and in our mind, in the eyes of God, this is such a small thing. And rest assured, God's grace is sufficient. Brother Estelle, let me turn the service back over to you.